Segment 23, Studying the Solar Interior Using Helioseismology. In order to have a complete understanding of the Sun and how it works, we need to understand what's inside it and use that to test models that we have based on elementary physics for how a star like the Sun might work. So how can we know what's going on inside the Sun? We only see the solar photosphere, and that photosphere is only a few thousand kilometers of penetration into the surface of a, of a body that's 700,000 kilometers to the middle. It turns out that the, the key to understanding it is two kinds of measures that reach us from the Sun. One of these we won't talk about very much right now, which is the neutrinos, that the nuclear reactions inside the Sun produce tiny elementary particles that interact very, very weakly with matter. And these pass right through the Sun and come out, and some of them can be detected at the Earth's surface. Unfortunately, so few can be detected because they interact so weakly that they don't provide much in the way of detailed information about the processes at the center of the Sun. The solar oscillations, however, are another matter altogether. We talked about about oscillations before and about modes of musical instruments and how you can tell from from the structure of the of the overtones of the instrument what kind of an instrument it is whether it's an oboe or a flute or something like that. It turns out that the sun has resonances as well that if you if you make a small perturbation in the in the sun if you bang on the sun just a little bit with just a fluctuation of one kind or another the sun will ring and it rings in a in a variety of different tones the simplest one being a simple radial oscillation a breathing oscillation in and out but many many higher order oscillations are on top of that of different types and the relative strengths of these different oscillations and their presence or absence are very determinative about the structure of the inside of the Sun. They tell us how temperature and density vary as a function of distance into the middle of the Sun. By observing the Sun continuously for a very long period of time, it's possible to measure many, many, many different of modes of oscillation in the Sun and to follow the evolution of these modes over time, how they vary. And so many years ago now, about 15 years ago, a network of telescopes was set up around the world, the Global Oscillation Network Group. Uh, and the reason for doing this is you want to keep observing all the time because the subtleties get lost if you your observations are, are interrupted by nighttime. So by having identical telescopes spread throughout the world, we're able to get more or less continuous coverage and measure these oscillations over time and spatially distributed over the sun where they make small changes in the rel in the brightness of the solar surface that allow you to see the results of these fluctuations in the local density due to the essentially sound waves inside the sun. Once we understand the structure we have to ask ourselves now how does the sun get the energy that it needs to shine it's emitting a huge amount of energy in the form of radiation every second and we know from the fact that the earth has been here for about 4.7 billion years that the sun has to last on the order of 5 billion years or more based on the fossil record we know that the luminosity of the sun must have been fairly constant over time because the temperature of the Earth's surface, while it varies, does not vary by an enormous amount. And in the short term, the luminosity must be very constant because we can measure over a period of 20 or 30 years and the output from the Sun changes very, very little over that amount of time. So how does the Sun manage to accomplish this? Well, nuclear fusion is the source of the Sun's energy, in particular fusing hydrogen to make helium. And we'll talk about uh, nu uh, nuclear reactions, nuclear fusion in particular, in uh, another segment coming very soon. This happens in the very core of the Sun because you need to have very high temperatures and very high densities for it to happen. So it's only the very inner part of the Sun that's generating energy through nuclear fusion. And somehow this energy has to get out to us through the entire set of outer layers of the Sun. So how does it manage to do this? Well, the answer is it does it any way it can by a combination of different methods. So the methods that are available uh, potentially are radiation, conduction, and convection. So conduction is the is, is the transfer of heat by vibrations along a temperature gradient where where energy in a in a high 
uh, temperature region causes more vibrations that then push on the atoms in in another part of the system and excite them more the push on another ones in another part of the system and excite them but conduction in gases is generally very very poor it works very well in this case of holding a spoon over a candle but gases are very poor conductors and this is in fact one of the reasons why when we want to stay warm in the winter time we try to put um, layer of air between uh, uh, two pieces of cloth as a very effective way to stop uh, stop conduction of heat so we don't lose heat so for example you do this when you have a down comforter or if you buy a down jacket the figure of merit for a down jacket is what's called loft which is the amount of spacing you get between the outer layers for a given amount of weight and it's the air actually in there that's providing the insulation between you and the outside world so conduction is not particularly effective. Radiation is. If you have a hotter black body surrounded by a cooler one, the hotter black body will be emitting more energy per unit area. The, out, the cooler one will be emitting less. And so when you look at the balance of emission and absorption in the hot object, the object will lose energy. As long as the radiation can get out, radiation is a very effective way to transfer energy from one place to another. Another method is called convection. And this is something we see uh, for example, when you heat up water in a pan or oil in a pan, that if you have a hot layer, the hot layer will expand. And, it, and in a gravitational field, that expansion makes that layer buoyant, and it will rise. When it gets to a place where it can cool off radiatively, it will get rid of its energy and then uh, contract again and become more dense and sink back down again. And this circulation effectively transmits energy from a hotter region to a cooler region by bulk motion of the gas that's circulating back and forth. So in the sun, it turns out that most of the energy that's generated in the core initially moves by radiation. It moves outward, but the zone that it's moving through is fairly opaque, and the radiation can't move in a straight line. It's instead scattered repeatedly off of different ions and electrons in the gas and gradually diffuses its way outwards. Eventually, the opacity becomes so large that the diffusion is very inefficient and a temperature gradient builds up where the, the radiation the, the, the radiation is not moving the, the, the energy out very quickly. And as a result, you get a pile up and you have a hotter zone with a cooler zone above it. This is the perfect starting condition for convection. So this hotter zone expands, the gas becomes buoyant, it rises up, gets to the to the photosphere of the sun where the sun again becomes very transparent and at that point it can radiate away the energy cool off and drop back down again